this has to be a part of that. All right, let's go to Glenn. Two, two quick questions. First of all, let's uh, have some statistics. Uh, there have been a lot of studies out there that don't show a correlation between uh, low-skilled immigration and the loss of jobs for native workers. Uh, cite for me, if you could, one or two studies with specific numbers that prove the correlation between those two things, because your entire policy is based on that. And secondly, I had sources that told me about a month ago that you guys have sort of elbowed infrastructure out of the way to get immigration uh, on the legislative queue. Tell me why this is more important than infrastructure. Well, the latter statement isn't true. I think the most recent study I would point to is the study from George Borjas that he just did about the Muriel boat lift. And he went back and re-examined and opened up the old data and talked about how it actually did reduce wages for workers who were living there at the time. And Borjas has, of course, done enormous amounts of research on this, as has the uh, Peter Kersenow on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, as has Steve Camerata at the Center for Immigration Studies, and so on and so on. Sciences, engineering, and medicine. And, right, and the recent study said that as much as $300 billion a year may be lost as a result of our current immigration system in terms of folks drawing more public benefits than they're paying in. But let's also use common sense here, folks. At the end of the day, why do special interests want to bring in more low-skilled workers? And why historically... Yeah, I'm not asking for common sense. I'm asking for specific... Well, I think statistical it's very clear, data. Glenn, that you're not asking for common sense. But if I could just answer... If I could just answer your question, I named, I, named, I named the studies, Glenn. Glenn, 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 I named the studies. I named the studies. I asked you for a statistic. Can you tell me Glenn, how many... The, how maybe many, we'll make a carve-out in the bill yeah. that says the New York Times can hire all the low-skilled, less-paid workers they want from other countries and see how you feel then about low-wage substitution. This is a reality that's happening in our country. No, maybe it's time we had compassion, Glenn, for American workers. Oh, I, I, President Trump has met with American workers who've been replaced by foreign yeah, workers and ask, asking ask for them, ask them how this has affected their lives. Look at, I, I just told you. Low-skilled jobs that Americans might otherwise have. Why? The, I mean, if you look, first, first of all, if you look at the, if you look at the premise, Glenn, of bringing in low-skilled labor, it's based on the idea that there's a labor shortage for lower-skilled jobs. There isn't. The number of people living in the United States in the working ages who aren't working today is at a record high. One in four Americans, or almost one in four Americans between the ages of 25 and 54 aren't even employed. For African American workers, their labor force participation rate who don't have a high school diploma, I guess African American males without a high school diploma, has plummeted some 40 percentage points since the mass wave of unskilled migration began. The reality is that if you just use common sense, and yes, I will use common sense, the reason why some companies want to bring in more unskilled labor is because they know that it drives down wages and reduces labor costs. Our question as a government is, to whom is our duty? Our duty is to U.S. citizens and U.S. workers to promote rising wages for them. If low-skilled immigration was an unalloyed good for the economy, then why have we been growing at 1.5% for the last 17 years at a time of unprecedented new low-wage arrivals? It's just the facts speak for themselves. At some point, we're accountable to reality. And the other hand, like I said, you have ultra high skilled workers who are at the back of the line, which makes no sense in the year 2017. Neil, let me go to you. Now, now talking to African American male. Here's a fairly simple question. Are you now targeting the black unemployment rate that is? traditionally and historically higher than the average American? Is that what you're looking at? There's no history? doubt, and I'll go to Neil, but there's no doubt, and it's very, very sad and very unfair, that immigration policy, both legal and illegal, over the last several decades, this has a deleterious impact on African American employment in general, and certainly African American males, and it's been quite tragic, and we as a country have to have a conversation about that. Neil? Okay, so thanks very much. One of the arguments made against this bill is that large-scale immigration will increase the total number of jobs. Senator Graham, for example, said he wants more immigration to bring in more restaurant jobs, more resort jobs, bed cleaning jobs, and such like. Is it better for this country to have more jobs or, or higher wages and higher productivity for Americans? Well, I think at the end of the day, President Trump's been clear that he's a pro-high-wage president. He ran as a pro-high-wage candidate. And that's what this policy will accomplish. At the same time, to the point about economic growth, we're constantly told that unskilled immigration boosts the economy. But again, if you look at the last 17 years, we just know from reality that's not true. And if you look at wages, you can see the effects there. If you look at the labor force, you can see the effects there. 
And so again, we're ending unskilled chain migration, but we're also making sure that the great inventors of the world, the great scientists of the world, the people that have the next great piece of technology can come into the United States and compete in a competitive application process, a point space system that makes sense in the year 2017. All right, let me go to you. Uh, two questions. One, you did personalize it with the New York Times, so normally this wouldn't be a question, but will the Trump Organization stop bringing in foreign workers on visa programs uh, to set an example for other businesses in the interim before this bill uh, becomes law? Well as, well, as you know, the only way to have immigration policy work is it has to be national, it has to be uniform. You can't have different rules and different procedures for different companies. The, this bill, of course, doesn't deal with guest workers and temporary non-immigrant visas, which is, I think, what you're asking about, and that's a separate thing. But the president was clear, if you go back and look at his debate on this it, during the primary, where he said, as a businessman, my responsibility is to operate my business according to the laws of the United States as they exist. He said, as president, my responsibility is to pass laws that make sure we have an immigration system that prioritizes American workers. He said that throughout the campaign, and he said it as a candidate, and he said it now. But just as a technical matter, you're talking about a different aspect of the immigration system. Today, we're talking about the, the green card system, but it's a good question. Let me move on over there. Thank you, Stephen. Hold on a second. Thank you, Stephen. Just to take the question in another direction, uh, USA Today and others have shown that over the last seven years, there's been a negative flow of immigration across the southern border. And of course, unemployment is that perhaps a 10-year low right now. So will there be enough workers in the Southwest states if this policy were to go into effect? Well, yeah, so I think we're talking about different things, and I appreciate the question. Net migration overall has been at a record pace. The, um, you're talking, I think, just about some questions about net migration illegally across the southern border. Right. We're talking today about green card policy. Every year we issue a million more green cards. Um, and it just keeps adding on every year after year after year. And so the supply of foreign labor is at a record high. I think the foreign born population right now is 45 million. I think there's 25 million foreign workers in the United States. Um, all right, right there. The, yep. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, two questions for you. First, does the Trump administration plan to defend the DACA program if Texas and eight other states bring a lawsuit challenging in the court? Well, we are not gonna make an announcement on that today because there is ongoing litigation and DOJ and DHS are reviewing that. But I will say that whatever we do is going to prioritize the interests of American citizens and workers. Stephen, Zoe Daniel from Australian yeah. Broadcasting. You've talked about the Australian policy. Can you speak more specifically about what the administration likes and also how that extends into things like family sponsorship? You mentioned bringing in elderly relatives, for example, who might not be productive, yet in Australia, adult children can sponsor their parents to immigrate. So which elements of the policy are you choosing that you might like right. to So use? we looked at the Australian system, the Canadian system. We took things we liked. We added things that made sense for America and where we are as a country right now. One of the things I think is most compelling about the Australian system is the efforts to make sure that immigrants are financially self-sufficient and make sure they're able to pay for their own health care and things of that nature. And that's certainly one of the things we took from that. And obviously, the, the point space system that Canada has has a lot to recommend it. And we actually, we took that and we added things that were all new to it and they're released today and that um, make sure that we have a highly competitive application process. Look, there's 7 billion people in the world. And so the question of who gets that golden ticket needs to be a discerning process that makes sense. Again, in an environment in which you have this huge pool of unemployed labor in the United States and you're spending massive amounts of money putting our own workers on welfare doesn't it make sense economically to say, let's get our own workers, immigrant and US born, off of welfare, into the labor market, earning a living wage, able to pay into taxes, instead of bringing in lower wage substitutes, while at the same time ensuring that the inventors, the innovators and the scientists are able to come into our country and add to our economy and our GDP, but not as substitutes for Americans. NBC. Thank you so much. Can you respond to some of the critics within your own party who say what we really should be focused on is comprehensive immigration reform in order to really tackle the problem in a serious way? And secondly, what do you say to those who say this just separates families and it's effectively uh, cutting an effectiveness program? Well, actually, the legislation for folks who are already here, they are able, who are, have pending family-based sponsorships, they're actually grandfathered in. So it's a, it's a new system moving forward. 
point one. And point two is that beyond the immediate family members that are covered in the bill, i.e. your minor children and your, um, and your spouses, your other relatives can come in. They just have to come in through the point space system. Uh, and then your other, your first part of your question. question about comprehensive immigration reform. Some Republicans say we should be focused on comprehensive immigration reform instead of a sliver uh, of the problem in order to really address the broader root problem of immigration. Well, Why not tackle it from that standpoint? Let me ask you a hypothetical, and I mean it in all sincerity. If let's say that we had introduced a 2,000-page comprehensive immigration reform bill, would we be having this conversation today about green card policy? I suspect we wouldn't be. I think it's time that we forced the conversation onto this core issue. I know the president feels that it's enormously advantageous to have a conversation about this core aspect of immigration reform because it does receive so little discussion, and yet it's so enormously important. Hey, hold on, let's go to you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned lawmakers have a choice to make. Is President Trump going to make this a campaign issue next year? Well, I mean, we're making it a an issue, period, starting, well, he started in the campaign when he was running, but as far as a real push for change, that begins in earnest, aggressively, starting today. And I do think, you know, I just work on the policy side, but I do think that voters across the country are going to demand these kinds of changes because, again, of the effects it has on their lives and their communities. And this is overwhelmingly popular. And I challenge any news organization here, do a poll, ask these questions. Do you think we should favor applicants to our country who speaks English, yes or no? Do you think that we should make sure that workers who come into our country don't displace existing American workers? Do you think people who come into our country should receive welfare or be financially self-sufficient? Do you think we should prioritize people based on skill? Do you think that we should reduce overall net migration? Do you think we should have unlimited family chain migration? You ask any of these questions, look at the polls, look at the results you'll get in your own news organizations, and they'll be very clear. Uh, two for you. Uh, first, uh, following up with Noah's question regarding you know, the president's talked a lot about immigration reform. This has been held up in the past. He has the power today to take personal action on this by changing the way his Trump, his Trump properties, Mar-a-Lago, and others bring in unskilled foreign workers, displacing, as you talked about, the large uh, large numbers of Americans who are looking for work in these states. So, is the president planning on taking that action? And secondly, uh, does this signal that the White House does not believe that any sort of comprehensive action on immigration is possible with this Congress, that immigration needs to be tackled in a piecemeal fashion going forward? Well, again, just as a technical matter, you're talking about non-immigrant guest worker visas, and this legislation deals with green cards, i.e. permanent immigration. So, they're two totally separate categories. But I'll just refer everyone here today back to the president's comments during the primary when this was raised in a debate, and he said, my job as a businessman is to follow the laws of the United States. And my job as president is to create an immigration system that works for American workers. And that's one of the reasons why I think Americans so deeply admire President Trump is because they see every day he's not working for himself. He said over and over again, I've been very successful. I've had a great life. Now I'm here to work for the American people. But for any immigration system to be functional and to work, it has to be uniform across the board. One standard for everyone. Can you say how close the president is to getting a uh, nominee for DHS? And can you add, if this legislation is not moving by the end of the year, how much is it possible for you to do through executive action, if any? Well, I certainly think that on the um, administrative action front, uh, you can tighten up and continue to tighten up enforcement on visa rules and standards. Um, and I think that's certainly something that um, we'd be looking at doing. But we'd like to create a permanent change to our immigration system that will endure through time, that will still be in place many decades from now. And that's what this legislation would accomplish. And I would just, again, encourage everyone to understand the depth of this change. What President Trump has done today is one of the most important legislative moves that we've seen on this issue in many, many years. The President of the United States said, I am taking a stand today for American workers and the American economy, and we're putting American families first on immigration. We're saying our compassion, first and foremost, is for struggling American families, and our focus is on the national interest. That is a major event, and all of your news organizations should take a hard look 
at the polls on these questions and see where folks are. And you'll see that this is an issue that's supported by Democrats, independents, and Republicans across the board. One last question, and then I'll hand it back to Sarah. Steve, Steve, if they are on the polls, Steve, Steve, on the polls. Steve, 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 more than one? Maybe, maybe. Steve, 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 two? Steve, two questions. I get a lot of, Glenn, a lot of energy from up front here. If this, is, if this is so huge and major, you make it sound so enormously important. Yes. Why did the senators who were with the president today call it modest and incremental? Is it modest and incremental? And aside from that, you seem to be suggesting this is immigration reform. Does this come even close to stemming illegal immigration for the president? Well, so the, of course, the answer is, is that it's the divide between how Americans think about immigration and how Washington thinks about immigration. So to everyday Americans, this is the most rational, modest, common sense, basic thing you can do. Of course, you shouldn't have foreign so workers. And of course, you shouldn't have foreign workers displacing American workers in Washington. This represents a sea change from decades of practice. So it just depends what lens you're looking at it through. Sea change. <laughs> this depends what lens you're looking at it through. I, I guarantee you, go to, say, like an ed board for a couple of your papers and see what they think about it. They'll see it as a sea change. Talk to an everyday guy in the street and he'll say, this is the most common sense thing. Or she'll say, this is the most common sense thing that I've seen in my entire life. And it's right down straight the center of American politics and American political views. So I take one last question. Who has who has the best last question? All right, so, um, so I'll do for the last question right here. Thank you, I appreciate it. I, and I thank you very much for coming out here and talking to us on camera. But I'd like to ask you if you've recently spoken with your old boss uh, and what you make of the rift between President Trump and the Attorney General. You worked for Jeff Sessions for many years. Well, I think Sarah's already spoken about that at length, and that's not why I'm here today. But I think if I remember what she said correctly, I'll say it again. The president has confidence in all of his cabinet and expects them to perform their duties honorably and fully on behalf of the American people. But since the last question is, is not on the subject at hand, I will take one actual last question on the subject at hand. So I will take, yes. Uh, what you're proposing here, what the president is proposing here, does not sound like it's in keeping with American tradition when it comes to immigration. The Statue of Liberty says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. It doesn't say anything about speaking English or being able to uh, compu be a computer programmer. Uh, aren't you trying to change what it means to be an immigrant coming into this country if, if you're telling them uh, you have to speak English? Uh, can't people learn how to speak English when they get here? Well, first of all, right now, it's a requirement that to be naturalized, you have to speak English. So the notion that speaking English wouldn't be a part of our immigration systems would be actually very ahistorical. Secondly, I don't want to get off into a whole thing about history here, but the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of liberty enlightening the world. It's a symbol of American liberty lighting the world. The poem that you're referring to that was added later is not actually part of the original Statue of Liberty, but more fundamentally, the so history, saying, so they, but saying, more fundamentally, you're saying the that history, that does not represent. I'm saying that, what I'm the saying that the notion, I'm saying the notion that the, I'm saying the notion, Sorry. No, that sounds here's, like here's, that sounds Jim, like, let me ask you a question. That sounds like some uh, national park revisionism. No. The statue, you the you statue of Liberty Jim, has always Jim, been a beacon of hope to the world Jim, for people to send Jim, do you believe, their people to this country. Jim, and they're not always going to speak Jim, English, Stephen. Jim, they're not you believe, always going to be highly skilled. They're not always Jim, going to be Jim, somebody. Jim, Jim, I appreciate your speech. Down, Jim, I appreciate your speech. So let's let's talk about this. It was a, it was a modest Jim, let's talk about this. In 1970, when we let in 300,000 people a year, was that violating or not violating the Statue of Liberty law of the land? In, 19, in the 1990s, when it was half a million a year, was it violating or not violating the Statue of Liberty law of the land? Was it violating? When it was 700,000 a year, no, tell me and, what years, and the, and the tell me what years, tell me what years meet, tell me what years meet Jim Acosta's definition of the Statue of Liberty poem, law of the land. So you're saying a million a year is the Statue of Liberty number. 900,000 violates it, 800,000 violates it. You're, you're sort of bringing a Jim. press one for English philosophy here to Jim. immigration, and that's never for been Jim. what the United States has been about, Steve. That I mean, you're, but you're also, your, your statement's also shockingly ahistorical in another respect, too, which is if you look at the history of immigration, it's actually ebbed and flowed. We've had periods of very large waves, followed by periods of less immigration and more immigration. And during we're the, we're the, we've had a period of immigration right now, the yeah, president wants to build a wall. Actually, you want to bring about a sweeping change to the immigration Surely, Jim, system. you don't actually think that a wall affects green card policy. You couldn't possibly believe that, do you? Actually, the notion that you actually think immigration is at a historic law, 
the foreign-born population in the United States with, today. With the Jim. New Jim. Talk, talking about how border crossings do you work. really I, mean, I want to be serious Jim do you really at CNN not know the difference between green card policy and illegal immigration Sir, are, I mean are you why, really why don't know that Cuban immigrant. he came to this country in 1962 uh, right before the Cuban Missile Crisis and obtained a green card <laughs> yes people who immigrate okay, to this so, country so Jim, can eventually people who so Jim, immigrate to this country question, through, Jim, not through Jim, Island, as a factual as Jim as have, a factual question ways do a, obtain a green card at some point they do it through a lot of hard work, and yes, they may learn English as a second language later on in life. So, but, but this Jim, whole this whole notion of well, they could learn, you know, they have to learn English before they get to the United States. Are we just going to bring in people from Great Britain and Australia? Jim, it's actually, I have to honestly say, I am shocked at your statement that you think that only people from Great Britain and Australia would know English. It's actually it reveals your cosmopolitan. Uh, bias to a shocking degree that in your mind no this is an amazing this is an amazing moment this is an amazing moment that you think only people from Great Britain or Australia would speak English is so insulting to millions of hard-working immigrants who do speak English from all over the world Jim have you honestly Jim have you honestly never met a an immigrant from another country who speaks English outside of Great Britain and Australia? Is that your personal experience? Sure, of course there are people who come But that's not what you said. And it shows, it shows your cosmopolitan bias. And I just want to it say- It sounds like to you're trying to engineer the and racial say, and ethnic flow of people into this country. Yeah, this that policy. is one of the most outrageous, insulting, ignorant, and foolish things you've ever said. And for you, that's still a really, the, the notion that you think that this is a racist bill is so wrong and so insulting. Jim, the reality is, is that the foreign-born population into our country has quadrupled since 1970. That's a fact. It's been mostly driven by green card policy. Now, this bill allows for immediate nuclear family members to come into the country, much as they would today, and then it adds an additional points-based system. The people who've been hurt the most, the people, been, the people who've been, the people who've been, the people who've been, the people who've been hurt the most by the policy you're advocating, are what policy am I advocating? apparently just unfettered, uncontrolled migration. The people who've been hurt the most by the policy, the people who've been hurt the most by the policy that you're, the people who've been hurt the most by the policy you're advocating are immigrant workers and minority workers and African-American workers and Hispanic workers. Are you targeting and it has African-American no community now? You brought it up again. You said you wanted to have a conversation and not target. Is it going to be a target? This is now? what we want to do. Using the African-American community, are you going to target? I'm not trying to be funny. But right, I know what you're saying. What you're saying is 100% correct. We want to help unemployed African-Americans in this country and unemployed workers of all backgrounds get jobs. And insinuations like Jim made trying to ascribe nefarious motives to a compassion immigration measure designed to help newcomers and current arrivals alike is wrong. And this is a positive, optimistic proposal that says 10 years, 20 years, 30 so years from now, 10 years, 20 time. years, 30 years from now, we want to have an immigration system that takes care of the people who are coming here and the people who are already living here by having standards, by having a real clear requirement that you be able to support yourself financially by making sure that employers can pay a living wage. And that's the right policy for our country, and it's the president's commitment to taking care of American workers. I apologize, Jim, if things got heated, but you did make some pretty rough insinuations. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Sarah. I think that went exactly as planned.